killed him because he claimed to be the Son of God. They didn't count on it being true. It's a fascinating premise, the TV show Apocalypse by Darren Brown. Um, people still debate, is it true that this uh, character, Stephen, had no idea that he was on a TV show? But the premise is fascinating. What Darren Brown does in his two episodes was stage the taking over of this guy's life, Stephen. And through hacking into his phone and... Well, beginning to create a, a sort of an environment around him where he believes that meteors are going to attack with hidden cameras watching him the whole time. He slowly leads him into a staged event where he becomes convinced that he's in the middle of an apocalypse. Now, Stephen has been cast, he's been selected because of how sort of self-centered and narcissistic he is. Um, and and uh, the question is, is if you take basically a self-interested human who's just worried about themselves, but throw them into this sort of catastrophic, apocalyptic setting. Will a courageous, a heroic, and even potentially compassionate um, heart emerge? Will, will we, when needed, become a hero? Will we become a compassionate, other-centered person? And, and so then the question for those of us sort of watching the show, if you want to watch it, it's on YouTube now. Um, if you want to watch it, the question for us is, uh, is the reason that possibly we get swept into sort of a comfortable and, and sort of more self-interested life is just basically because the overarching story of our lives um, has no true challenge to it, no adventure. Nobody needs us to be heroic. And so we just sort of, sort of slide along with things and slowly become interested in ourselves and, um, and turn inward. Do we need to be pried out of our comfort and thrown into an adventure 
for us to awaken the very best elements of who we can be, other-centered and compassionate um, people. Fascinating premise. Actually, this notion of average people being thrown into an epic adventure and into an apocalyptic setting is one of our most favorite sources of entertainment. All sorts of, of uh, movies um, have followed this, this train for years and years. I remember as a kid, one of a sort of a young farmer taking on the evil empire, then later tracking with a, a techno geek nerd uh, who had to take on the evil matrix. Uh, I probably most strongly identified with uh, a little guy from the Shire, <laughs> a hobbit, uh, who I, I, I see eye to eye on many things, um, <laughs> taking on a demonic overlord. Uh, and most recently, totally loved watching um, Emmett, the average construction worker, who um, had to take on the evil Mr. Business and his threatening weapon, Craggle. And so, just to inspire us all to go see the movie, can we roll it? Everything is awesome. Everything is cool when you're part of a team. Come on, everybody. All right, all right, that's great. All right. If that doesn't inspire you to go see the movie, nothing will. Fantastic movie, absolutely loved it. Actually, just recently, actually this week, I just went to see uh, the most latest, uh, the latest installment of the epic battle, Captain America. And uh, cr uh, a creation from um, back in World War II, this Captain America, average sort of weak guy who gets injected with something that makes him the very best version of himself. He doesn't have any superhero powers. He's just the best human possible. And he takes with his shield... He takes on all sorts of evil enemies. He's been resurrected to be a part of this new sort of you know, amazing blockbuster series, uh, Avengers, and he has his own shows. Amazing. Captain America. We are fascinated by these average people who are thrown into these uh, sort of catastrophic ap apocalyptic settings where they have to save the world. And then what we watch is how they are transformed and they become heroic. So I want to throw this out as we get into this. What's your overarching story? And based on that overarching story that you believe you're living, what is being drawn out of your life? How heroic are you? How important are your decisions in terms of seeing lives saved? And in the midst of that, how compassionate are you? I want us to take a look at a passage of Scripture. And it's uh, from Jesus interacting with his disciples. And in that passage of Scripture, basically what Jesus does is flip their worldview on its head. Everything they think is going on, he helps them reimagine to relaunch them into a whole new life. Um, to do that, though, we have to look at the backstory because he's referring to a vision from the prophecy of Daniel. And he uses this prophecy to help them reimagine what's happening. So that's from Daniel 7. If you want to get your Bibles out, we're going to be looking at Matthew 16. You can get your Bibles out, turn to that. Um, and then we're going to look at Daniel 7 and then work our way through Daniel 17. Uh, or Matthew 16. So while you're doing that, though, let me make an announcement as you're pulling out your Bibles. Um, if you don't have Bibles, at all of our sites we have Bibles. At the back here in Oakville, there's Bibles. Feel free to grab one. It's like our textbook uh, that we work through. Um, a little announcement from me. A few years ago, if you'll remember, Bruxy went on a sabbatical. And uh, guess who gets one this summer? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, the overseers uh, have decided my performance has slowly been sliding. And uh, they need to do something to shake, shake it up. No, actually, after uh, th this summer, it'll be 13 years working in the meeting house. And uh, they've decided that to help recalibrate me for the future, they're going to give me an extended time to write, uh, to reflect, uh, to do some study, prayer, uh, be refreshed, sharpen the saw. And so anyways, uh, I'm going to be disappearing in a few weeks on my sabbatical, but I won't be forgetting you. Uh, my heart is with you, but I'll be doing that uh, study and uh, some writing, hopefully, hopefully a second book uh, to come out uh, in the not-too-distant future to follow up. God enter stage left. So anyways, just uh, a little announcement. It might seem, might seem happier than normal. Um, <laughs> now you know why. Well, let's look at Daniel 7, a, a prophecy. Um, you don't need to turn to it. I'm just going to talk us through Daniel 7. And um, this prophecy 
uh, is, is actually a dream, a vision that Daniel had, had, and he writes it down. And it's in the Holy Scriptures for the Jews of Jesus' day. And they would have uh, read these as with other prophecies, other visions and dreams. Now, as we work our way through this vision, what you're going to uh, immediately realize, it's like this dream or vision is sort of like a pizza dream. Have you ever had one of those where like you wake up in the morning, it's like, man, what did I eat before bed? Because it's just this bizarre, you know, bizarre images sort of all mishmashed together. And you think, okay, where did that come from? Well, as we work through this prophecy, that's very much how it reads. It's this fantastical sort of uh, vision scape um, about a, a, an apocalyptic battle. And so uh, let's work our way through it because it captured the imagination of the Jewish people of Jesus' day and, and was sort of the backdrop of their thinking as they're thinking about what they're experiencing. Daniel 7. Let's take a look at it. Here in Daniel 7, it, uh, it's uh, during the first year of King Belshazzar that Daniel has this vision at night or this dream at night. The very first thing he sees in this vision is a sea of chaos as the winds of heaven start blowing over a sea, uh, the great sea. Now the sea was a place of danger, a place of evil, a place of chaos. Um, now, what you're going to notice behind me as I work through my teaching today is I have some drawings from an artist here at the meeting house. His name is Haas Monzon. And so it's going to help us get into the imagery, the, the, um, the, the vision that both Daniel uh, writes out, but also then Jesus refers to. Don't you love it? Isn't that cool? This sea of chaos. It was a place of evil. Well, what happens in this sea of chaos Beasts begin to emerge. Four beasts in particular begin to emerge. The first beast that comes up is a lion, but it has wings like an, evil, an eagle. Uh, a lion is a predator, but with eagle's wings, it begins to uh, be able to move quickly and strike quickly to attack and devour its, uh, its victims. The second beast that emerges is a bear with ribs in its mouth. Again, a terrible beast, a gruesome beast. The, four, the third beast that emerges is a leopard, but it's a four-headed leopard with four wings. And it can strike in any direction. The final beast that emerges has huge iron teeth, ten horns. It um, very much is, uh, fits the description of a, of a dragon, um, like an, an ancient serpent, an evil uh, dragon coming up out of the sea. We can imagine how terrifying this dream is. These beasts are coming up out of this place of evil and chaos and consuming and attacking. While a hero appears on the scene, it's the ancient one it's described in Daniel 7. And he's coming on a throne chariot, uh, blazing with fire and fire blasting out from him. He's brilliant white. This ancient of days is Yahweh, um, the, the God of the Israelites. And he's going to do battle with these beasts. In fact, he takes on the, the dragon and slays the dragon. After this collision, this battle between the Ancient of Days, out of this battle scene emerges one that is described as one like a son of man. And he's ushered into the Ancient of Days presence. And all the nations worship him. Who is this son of man? The word son of man just simply means average man. But it means more than that. The, the son of human, uh, the, the child, the human child, or the, the human descendant. Um, for the Israelites, they anticipated, um, based on the prophecy given to, to Adam and Eve, that there would be a descendant who would come, who would step on the serpent's head and crush this ancient uh, enemy of God, Satan. And so... Here it seems as if this prophecy is brought forward again. That the descendant, the one has come, the son, the human son has come. And has done battle with the great dragon and has stepped on his head, has crushed him, has defeated him. Now what's puzzling about this prophecy, in, the, in this dream, all the nations of the world start worshipping this son of man. This, this average one who has come. And the Israelites are like, oh, what's going on here exactly? Aren't we just supposed to worship God alone? Well, that's not really answered. As the, as the text continues here in Daniel 7, this vision is described to Daniel, um, is explained to Daniel in the, and it, what he 
uh, is told by God is that these beasts coming up out of the sea are actually successive empires that will raise up against the, uh, the Israelite people. But their deliverance, um, the establishment of God's kingdom will come through the holy ones. Uh, the holy ones in Daniel, in your Bibles, if you look this up, you may see it translated as saints or, or holy people. Uh, the actual Aramaic here is uh, the holy ones. And this would have referred to the, the host, the tens of thousands around God, the um, angelic army that surrounds him. And so, as this is described to Daniel, this is the, the picture that they see. Like, look at these empires are going to be coming up, attacking us. God's going to come in and fight for us. There's that, that long-awaited rescuer that we've waited for will come and will do battle and will defeat this great dragon that comes up out of the sea. And, and these holy ones, this army of angels are going to come to our rescue and establish a kingdom. For the Israelites, this is... Um, hugely in, encouraging because they had been truly oppressed empire by empire, had moved in and taken possession of their land. They had been overrun and oppressed by various empires. There's the Babylonian Empire and then the, the Persian Empire, then the Greek Empire. And in Jesus' day, it was the Roman Empire. The disciples of, uh, of Jesus probably would have counted up. Do you know what? If you think of all the major empires that have come along, we are probably at number four. And this, this last empire is pretty dragon-like. It's pretty evil, this Roman Empire. And so they would have listened to this prophecy and, and, and imagined it in their minds. They would have thought, wow, this apocalyptic battle is about to happen. And as Daniel said, these holy ones are going to come and deliver us. These angelic armies are going to come and deliver us and reestablish our promised land and give us back the good life that we've been promised back with Moses that, that we'd finally have our safe country and we'd be prosperous and we'd live long and, and healthy and happy lives. And in the midst of this apocalyptic battle, that, that son of man will come, that, that rescuer, that one that we've waited for. Well, let's turn to, to Matthew now 16 and, and pick up the dialogue Jesus has with his disciples. And as we go through this, you're going to see how much this prophecy of Daniel has been plays into their dialogue. Starting at verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? You know that prophecy, that one of the apocalyptic battle, the Son of Man? Who do people say that he is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Here we see uh, that there is a wide range of, of opinion among the Israelites. Uh, John the Baptist was uh, a recent figure, it means uh, he, had, he had just died recently, but he had been alive and well and leading a movement. So um, some people are saying, look it, it's happening right now. Others say Elijah. Elijah had been whisked away and they've been waiting for, uh, wondering if Elijah would come back. That had been prophesied too. So, so some are saying, do you know what, it, ha it isn't happening yet. We're still waiting for this miraculous return of the prophet Elijah that was promised in Malachi. So it's somewhere in the future. It hasn't happened yet. And then finally others say, no, it's Jeremiah, it's one of the prophets. In other words, do you know what, that prophecy is over. It's long, that happened a long time ago. Um, you know, we don't need to worry about it anymore. So there's a debate, there's confusion. Then Jesus goes on to say, but what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? So Jesus has been performing miracles, he's been gathering a movement. He had been clarifying, giving teaching about the Son of Man. He says, look, there's a popular opinion out there and, and they, they debate, when is this all going to happen? When's this big battle going to happen? But let's bring it down to me. What do you think is going on with me? Who do you think I am? Peter steps forward, Simon Peter, and he says this, you are the anointed one. Uh, your translation may say the Christ. You are the Christ. Um, that word in the Greek means Messiah, 
in Hebrew, uh, the anointed one, the Christ. Uh, this is another title used in Daniel for that, for that uh, coming one. You are the Christ, the anointed one, the one who has the power of God with him, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood by people, but by my Father in heaven. Simon, you get it. God is showing you something here. And I tell you, Peter, is the word Peter uh, means rock. So there's a play, of, a play on words happening here. And on this rock, on this bedrock of truth, that I am the anointed one, that I am that one to come, I will build my church. Now, we may miss this because when we use the word church today, we tend to think of a building or we may even think of a gathering of Christians who are getting together uh, to talk about God or, or um, do things on God's behalf. This word ecclesia in the Greek that we translate church is actually a political word. It's a word that means the gathering of, a, of a citizens of a kingdom. So you could actually probably translate this as, I will build my Congress, or I'll build my Parliament. I will build my, my embassy. So again, as they anticipated the coming of this new kingdom of God, he's using a kingdom word here. He said, I'm going to rally the citizens of this new kingdom. And then he goes on to say, and the gates of Hades will not be able to stop or will not prevail. It's this picture of this army breaking through. Breaking through gates that have held people in a place of death. The place of Hades was a place of death. And he's saying, look, at, as this new community, this new citizens of a new kingdom are rallied behind me as the anointed one, as that coming rescuer. We're going to go, you know those gates? We're going to go break them down. We're going to be rescuing people who are bound up in death. Amazing image. He goes on to say this, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered the disciples not to tell anyone yet that he was the Christ, that he was the anointed one. If we just stop here, what an amazing discovery. What an amazing revelation for the disciples. Basically what they're hearing is, we're in the middle of, of an apocalypse. This battle is going to be, begin. And this miracle worker of God is the son of man that we've waited for. The battle is going to start. And not only this, we're going to be part of this citizenship of that new kingdom. We're going to be forming a new Congress. We're going to be setting up a new kingdom. And we're going to go to war and we're going to break through the gates, set free all of the captives who are being held by death. And they're giving us the, the power, the authority. It's like the master key to open any door. Talk about excitement. Talk about just like, really? That's what's going to happen. Well, Jesus doesn't stop there, though. He goes on. Listen to what he says next. Or what, what uh, Matthew records next. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem not to launch a war. He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. What? I thought we were supposed to do battle. Now you're starting to talk like you're going to commit suicide. So Peter, who was the first to speak, he figures out, look it, this is, this is not what we signed up for. He takes Jesus aside, begins to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Maybe Peter's thinking, you know, this is a test. He's saying all this stuff just to test us to see if we're serious. Because we know what happens when the Son of Man comes. We're going to 
basically go to war and the angels of heaven, uh, of heaven are going to come and join us. We're going to kill all the Romans and we're going to set up this new kingdom. Maybe this is some sort of test. He starts to rebuke him. Never, this is never going to happen to you. Jesus turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. What? He says, you are a stumbling block to me. You're getting in the way of what God wants here. You do not think the way God thinks, but how people think. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? And what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they've done. Truly I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. No doubt these words for the disciples were, it's like one of those completely disorienting times where Jesus is talking, they understand his language, but they have, it's like their brains are fighting through. What are you saying? What is going on here? Here's briefly, in brief, what they come to realize in time. The reason why what Peter was saying, he says, get behind me, Satan, is because the way that Peter was thinking, in fact, the way the disciples, in fact, how all of Israel was thinking, this notion of peace will finally come when we get our armies together and maybe get the help of heaven and we kill all of our enemies then we'll finally have peace. That this is not God's way. That God as creator never created us to bring peace by killing others. That this in fact is a false form of peace that comes up out of that sea of chaos, that comes out of the mouth or out of the vision of that ancient dragon to deceive people into thinking, I can finally have peace and wealth and security here and now by setting up a perimeter, hoarding all the good that I can, and then if anybody threatens me, I kill them. That way of thinking sets in motion and has set in motion generation after generation of war, conflict, those that have and those that don't have. And so... As the Israelites, as the disciples of Jesus had bought into that way of thinking, their whole concept of being delivered had become twisted and infected with the wrong way of thinking. They are actually hoping for an apocalyptic battle that somehow would give them the peace that they wanted but would be using the very tools, the very methods of this ancient dragon. And Jesus says, look it, for you to understand what that vision means, you have to reframe every part of that picture. You're not getting what God's heart is. You see, this average man that will come, this son of man will come, is not coming to kill. He's coming in love to lay his life down. And somehow in that miraculous event of self-sacrificial love, all of the power of sin, All of the power of hate and injustice, all of the work of this ancient enemy will be undone. And this new citizen, uh, these new citizens of this new kingdom, they're not going to be going out with swords in their hands trying to kill people. They're going to join in his example and they're going to become servants that go into the world willing to sacrifice, not trying to hoard willing to lay their life down, not to kill. And that's how this rescue mission is going to unfold. The authority of heaven that I'm giving you is to be the authority of servants. 
And so you see in the notes as you look there, Jesus in this powerful um, series of, of teachings to his disciples reframes their concept. As you read through the New Testament, this plays out the whole way. Who are the enemies? Is it, is it uh, the Roman Empire? Or is it the enemies? Is it somebody who threatens me? Who's going to take what I have? No. It's evil spiritual forces that move us into these places of conflict and hate. Who is the son of man? He will suffer for people, not kill them. He will lay his life down that they may have life. And what about this kingdom? Is it the, the promised land in Palestine? No, Jesus has to reframe that for them. And what they come to realize, it's not a geographic political kingdom, but a transnational relational kingdom for all people. Even this image of the Holy Ones, it's fascinating as you read through the New Testament. It's not here in this passage in Matthew 16, but as you continue to read through, it's fascinating um, that Paul, the apostle, his most common way to refer to Christians is to call them the Holy Ones. The Holy Ones are not the angels in heaven who are going to come and do battle. The Holy Ones are people who've been set apart by God who become their, their servants in the world. The word holy ones means you're, you've been set apart for God's purpose. So this whole vision of Daniel 7 had to be reimagined. This apocalyptic battle of good and evil that they're being drawn into had to be reframed. It was a spiritual battle. And then Jesus says, he says, yes, you will see me come in my Father's glory with the angels of heaven. That is true, but that's a future event. I will reward you at one time. In the future. But right now we're on, on a mission to rescue people through laying our lives down. You see, this is an important uh, truth not only for the disciples to grasp, but for us to grasp. I just had someone actually at a previous service when I was um, teaching this say, you know, if we go out and, and just sacrifice and, and sort of lay everything down, you know, like what happens if nothing works out? Like, what if I just, like, am super generous, lay my life down, and then, and then my life ends, and that's it? I'm like, yes, that's why Jesus said that there is an eternal life. There is a future life where he comes with his reward. Because for those of us that embark on this mission, it may not play out well. You may not be wealthy. You may not be successful in this life. But if you embark on this adventure with Jesus, uh, he gives the promise that in eternity, in the long view, that you receive his reward then. Well, as we think of this apocalyptic battle, as we reflect on the disciples who had to have their worldview flipped upside down, I want to bring this home to each one of us. You see the conclusion. What is the great quest of my life? If in fact, right now, today, this epic battle, this apocalyptic battle of good and evil is still going on in the world. If Jesus is still mobilizing people to break through the gates of Hades to see lives saved, lives transformed, if this is still going on, then each of us need to ask the question, I think, what is the overarching story of, of my life? How does my life fit into this reality? As you can see in the notes, what I've mapped out there is Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. This is a generic outline, actually, that is used pretty much in any great uh, storytelling. As you read through it, um, you probably think of many movies that fall into this, uh, into this pattern, this three-act play. I was talking with Johnny Asquith, who's from the film industry, and he gave this to me. He's been a part of like shooting The Hulk and all sorts of major movies. Uh, he's a, a field director for his Survivor Man series. And he, in this conversation with me, just sort of pointed out, oh, this is the basic template of a great story. As I looked at it, I'm like, yeah, do you know what that really does? That fits um, the template of what a great story is all about. Now, if you take this template, you can put different great quests as a part of this storyline. So let's say, you know, for some people, the great quest of their life is to raise a, sort of a, a wonderful family. And that's what they're all about. They just, they just want to have a nice home and, and some, you know, a uh, happy marriage and have some great kids. That's what, they, that's what they want. Well, as you go through this, you know, uh, they would have, 
you know, sort of that call, that vision. And then you come down to act two, they enter a dark and dangerous place. That's the teenage years. And then faces catastrophe, right? That's around uh, 16 years old, somewhere in there. And uh, anyways, that's how you play it out. So as you look at that template, what is your story and where are you at in this line? We're going to be talking about this uh, here at Home Church this week. Your storyline, though, if you think about it, would radically change, I think, and mine would, if we came to terms with the same vision that Jesus gave his disciples, wouldn't it? That if you framed and said, Do you know what, I'm no longer pursuing the dream that I had, but I'm pursuing this vision of being part of a new kingdom that is going to break through the gates and see people's lives changed. And no matter the cost, I know reward is coming in the future. That's what my vision is. Now you may say, okay, if I buy into this, Tim, today, and I, I, I say, okay, I'm open to that. I want to do this. Where do I get started? Um, I think we could still receive some, some cues just simply from the, the story of Jesus and what he did with his disciples. Because all Jesus said to his disciples when they started on their adventure was just simply this, come follow me. Come follow me. He didn't give a, a plan. He didn't give a strategy. He just simply said, if you reorient your life to make me the one who is leading and you open yourself up day by day to live in a relationship with me, my heart is to lead you into those places where you could be used. The resources you've been given, the time you've been given to help advance God's purposes in the world. Now you have to realize this is an, uh, an epic battle. This may cost you everything. You can't make as priority your own safety and security. But in terms of what your next step is, as simple as just saying, Jesus, you've asked me to follow you. I'm willing to follow you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we reflect on what the major story is in our own lives, um, we realize that our society hands us many storylines to follow. Whether it's success, having the perfect family, and yet, God, you come and offer us another option. You invite us into a spiritual battle that can transform the vision and purpose of our lives to see other people set free. To start... On this journey with you, we simply need to respond to your invitation when you say, come follow me. I pray for those here today that are basically in their hearts coming to terms with that invitation. I pray, God, that you would give them the courage to say yes to that invitation and join you on that adventure. May we as a church be a church that is joining you on this amazing adventure. Um, there's no better way for us to spend our time, our resources, our energies than to be a part of your amazing rescue mission. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.